became possessed of the whole alphabet, which I tested by applying it to the inscriptions of the Delhi column and Nana inscriptions. So when he got this word Da Na, and few of the consonants by then already known through the coins and the uh, inscriptions in Karli and the other Ashoka inscriptions, the entire alphabet was open for him. So the key was found to Ashoka, to the Brahmi. And then, just in the next few minutes, few hours, and next few days, he is able to read the Ashoka inscriptions. Uh, lots of, whether well, lots of manuscripts and inscriptions were sent to uh, the Asianic society. He started reading everything. The inscriptions on the Nagarjuna Hill, which is the inscriptions of the grandson of Ashoka Dasharatha, they were read. The Udaygiri and Kandagiri caves in Orissa, uh, the Hathikumpa inscription Correct. of Karameda, uh, the Junagadh rock inscription in uh, Gujarat, uh, where, which also incidentally has the inscription of, uh, uh, of, the, of the Gupta period, where they were, so basically it's a renovation of the tank. Hmm. Not, not the. No, no. So, Rudra minister no. says that he renovated a tank Tan. that Ashoka commissioned. Ah. And I think there is a uh, inscription of. Uh, of Rudra Amman. Rudra No, there's also one later or Gupta emperor who does an inscription ah, okay, there. Okay. Um, Skanda Gupta. Yeah. Skanda Gupta. Yeah. So, even, even those inscriptions are deciphered. And Sanchi has like few hundreds of inscriptions. So, in the next few days, he cracked all of this. And uh, in the end. His modesty comes out. He says, like most other in inventions, when once found, it appears extremely simple. And as in, uh, as in most others, accident rather than study has had the merit of solving the enigma, which has so long baffled the learner. And in the next volume of the inscription, he gives the key. He not only gives the key of ovals of the Brahmi, he also gives its variations from various periods. These are the this is the key of poles, this is all the consonants and Brahmi is cracked. 34 he starts, 37, the period of 3 years, Brahmi is cracked. And his fear that someone else will run away with this award is uh, quite because he, he, he eventually is the one who cracks it. Uh, it's, it's a bit of exaggeration to put all the credit, to give all credit to Prince him because uh, he is actually an important character. But lots of people are helping him, people are sending him copies of these inscriptions. Uh, like Charles Mason's disco uh, uh, discovery of uh, Agathocles coin was an important thing. So, all in all, Brahmi was deciphered. From there, you can trace every other inscription. Uh, so that's that's the story of how it became deciphered. But the interesting part is, now that you could read these scripts, they will start telling you new stories. What does it have? And eventually, the, in the period, there are lots of Ashokan pillars that are found across the country. All of them started with the word Devanam Piya uh, And uh, they were wondering, who is this king, Devanam Piya Piyadasi? What is he writing? Why is he sending, writing all this across the country? Uh, it remained an enigma for a long time. Eventually, there is a Sanskrit, uh, uh, there is a Sri Lankan book called Deepa Vamsha. Of a later period, not of not a counter contemporary of Ashoka's time, which talks about how Buddhism came to Sri Lanka, um, and that book talks about how Ashoka sent his son Mahinda uh, and his daughter named Sangamitta. Sangamitta, how they came from India and then they found all this and they spread Buddhism. So it is in that book they talk about they say Devanampiya Piyadasi was nothing but Ashoka, who was the son of Bindusara, who was the son of Chandra Maurya. So, I mean, uh, chapter 6 has the exact uh, sentence you would see Piyad Asana, Ashoka, uh, Ashoka Punna Tejana. And then basically it's saying Ashoka ruled in partly Putra, best of the towns. Three years after his coronation, he was converted to Buddha's fate. By the way, what's interesting is here this book doesn't tell it's after Kalinga War he became Buddhist. No. So it's, it's a bit controversial uh, whether, whether Ashoka really turned to Buddhism after Kalinga War. Uh, but anyway, he says the grandson of Chandra Gupta, son of Bindusara, while Sabiya prince was sucking of Ujjaini, charged with collecting the revenue of the crowns, and it was Ashoka. So it was still doubtful for me in my head when I read this that it's, a, it's not a contemporary text. Anybody could have written some other word. Uh, but what, uh, what eventually made me happy was that there is a place called Maski in Raichur. By the way, this is where Ashoka's relics are found across the country. And uh, Maski is one place where 
Ashoka name is written right next to Devanam Priyapriyadasi. So that kind of satisfied me that, okay, well, Devanam Priyapriyadasi was actually Ashoka. So it's just lying in a random village, man. Needs a lot of protection. Uh, so Musky Pillar talks about uh, that. Uh, another last question, last topic that I want to talk about is, we know this inscription is of stick characters and math inscription. So when did it get this name as Brahmi? Is its name really Brahmi? Is a question I was really interested in. Uh, so who gave this name Brahmi? Does the script in any way say that, okay, the script in which it's being written is Brahmi? No, there's nothing to that. So what's interesting is it's not really sure. It may not be Brahmi. So uh, the reason I'll tell you is this. There is a text uh, called Narita Vistara, Narita Vistara Sutra, which is a Buddhist te text of a later period. Uh, much, 600 years would have passed from Ashoka's period to the writing of this uh, book. It talks about, uh, it's, it's basically a hagiography, it's just saying Buddha was so great, he did this, he did that, blah, blah, blah. One of the chapters is where Buddha is going to the school. And uh, when he goes to school, uh, the teacher is like, oh, holy Buddha, what can I teach you? You know everything. So he goes to a school called script writing school, where they teach how to write. Okay, that's the school. And the teacher is like, Buddha, what can I teach you? Uh, you know all the scripts. Uh, and Buddha is a boy, but then like, it's a hagiography, you have to say good things about Buddha. So, and then Buddha says, okay teacher, in which script do you want me to write? And then he says, do you want me to write in Brahmi, Karoshti? And then he lists 64 scripts. Okay, by 6th century, there were this text tells us that there are at least 64 scripts in India by that time. But 64 is also a standard number in uh, Jain, uh, in Jain texts. Not just in Jain texts, but also in, in the Kama Sutra, for example, there are 64 arts. Oh. So it it might also just be a. Could, could have been anything. But then what's interesting? He lists the names of the scripts. He says, and the count is 64. He doesn't say there are 64 scripts. He names all those scripts. It, it has got Yamuna Lipi, which is the Greek character. Uh, so it's fascinating. So the first script that he mentions is Brahmi, and the second one is Karoshti. Using this as an evidence, and there is another Chinese text called uh, Fai, uh, A Grow of Pearls in the Garden of Dhamma, which is a Buddhist text written by Fai and uh, it's, it's a Chinese text. It talks about uh, Buddha's life and then the, also a bit about the Indian history of that period. It says during that time there were lots of characters prevalent. But the important one was Brahmi and Brahmi and Karoshti. Brahmi was written from left to right and Karoshti was written from right to left. Okay. Piecing this evidence with Lalita Vistara, if Karoshti, which is the second in the list of characters, if Karoshti is written from right to left, then the characters that are written from left to right must be Brahmi. He said, guess. Nothing more than that, no complete evidence. But of the 64, it could be anything. It, it could be. Uh, but are they legitimate scripts or because it was just praising him, was, was it just uh, like blank uh, scripts that they just. Doubtful, scripts? doubtful. Because if you read the name of the script, there's the Yavana Lipi, which is obviously the Greek. There are lots of weird names. We don't know what the scripts mean. Okay. So, in fact, the so there are many unknown ones in unknown that list. Yes, yes. So, we don't. Maybe the scripts are. We might have a written material for that, we but we don't know the name that of it. So, because Karashti was written from right left, the only thing that was written from left left was Brahmi. That's how they gave, gave the name Brahmi. Uh, and the name was not given by a prince by any chance. It was written, given by a person called G. Bowler. He was a German. Uh, the book uh, is called Indian Paleography. It's actually written in German, but then he dies of a, by falling into a pond, I think in a lake while rowing. Uh, but he made significant contributions. So the German copy is then translated to English and then eventually in that book I wrote, uh, he is actually written that. He is given the argument why he is calling that Brahmi. So it's not sure that the script is actually called Brahmi. It could be either of the 64 script. is what I believe. And you could believe anything, but it, the evidence is not convincing for me to call this script as Brahmi. Uh, this book, terms of the stuff. Any questions you have?